started okay okay so we were talking about dynamic programming so i received some comments before uh, at the end of the class that dynamic programming sounds very non intuitive so let's do an example okay to see why it makes perfect sense okay so why dp makes perfect sense let's say you have this problem of you want to go from x0 equal 0 x1 equals x0 plus u0 x2 equals x1 plus u1 and and you want to go from x2 x0 equals 0 to x2 equals 5 want x2 equals 5 okay So how should we formulate this problem? Well, we need to come up with a running cost and a terminal cost. So let's say my cost function j of u0 and u1 is given by u0 square plus u1 square plus infinity indicator function of x2 equals 5. Okay? So what is the indicator function uh, are all of you familiar with indicator function no okay so what is an indicator function indicator of x in a is 1 if oh i see what there is something wrong here okay 1 if x is in a and 0 if x is not in a so i should actually write it as x2 not equal to 5 okay so if you are not at 5 you pay an infinite cost if you are at 5 you pay a zero cost so now how do we solve this problem okay so what is a natural way to solve this problem well what some people told me is you know the natural way is to move forward and not backward okay so what i am saying and what the principle of dynamic programming says is well you need to solve this problem first and then you need to solve this problem okay let's say i go with the intuition and the intuition suggests we should solve this problem first and then we should move onward to the next problem and then the next problem so let's do that let's go with the intuition so let's if i want to solve this problem first what would my u0 be okay so what's my u0 star so solving step 1 solve u0 so min of u0 square what do i get i get 0 right so i won't take any step uh, at time t equals 0 then i go step 2 and i solve u1 square plus infinity indicator of x in a so not x i i haven't defined what a is but x2 not equal to 5 in which case in which case i get u1 star equals 
plus 5. And the total cost, 25. Okay, that's what I get if I don't do backward induction, if I just do forward optimization one stage at a time. So I get the total cost of 25. And what's the solution? Don't do anything in the first step. Take a long step in the second step. What does DP say? Well, DP says a lot of things. You know what? You should treat this as a one stage optimization problem, and then you find minimum U1 for every possible value of X1. Okay, so for every X1, find U1 star. So, okay, so let's do it. I don't seem to have any other option. Uh, so I pick, I want to minimize V1 of X1 is minimum of V1 square plus X1 plus U1 not equal to 5. U1 is in R. So what do I get if I solve this problem? So I want my x1 plus u1 to be equal to 5. Uh, so, so u1 automatically becomes 5 minus x1 square. Okay, and u1 star equals gamma1 star x1 which is equal to 5 minus x1. Okay. So I solved the second last stage problem, optimization problem. Then in step 2, I have to solve v0 of x0. And this also, I have, I'm supposed to do it for all possible x0, okay, but I'm given that x0 is equal to 0, so probably I should just compute it at x0 equals 0. It's minimum of u1 square or u0 square plus 5 minus x1 square. What is x1? So this is same as minimum over u0, u0 square plus 5 minus u0 square. So I'm x0 is equal to 0. So the solution for this problem, what is that going to be? So if you solve it, your gamma star 0 of x0 equals 0 is actually 2.5. Okay. So that's the dynamic programming way. What's the total cost here? Two point five square, which is u zero square, and since your x one becomes two point five, your u one star will be five minus two point five, so that's two point five. Two point five square. That's less than five square. Okay, which is what you got here. Okay, so DP makes perfect sense. Okay, this is the minimum cost that you can potentially achieve in this problem. What's better is that let's say you have some uncertainty in X1. Okay, 
somehow your state moved, somebody pushed you, okay? So instead of being at 2.5, you move to 2.8 or something. The fact that you have an optimal policy says that if you are at 2.8 instead of 2.5, which you had originally anticipated, you can potentially change your optimal action and use 2.2 instead of 2.5 that you would otherwise plan to do if there was no there was no one pushing you around okay so that's the that's a very very good property of dynamic programming you don't there is an easy way to update your action should something happen to your state during the course of your trajectory Gamma, gamma is the optimal policy. So gamma t is a policy that maps xt to ut. So it takes in the current state, gives you the current action that you ought to take. Okay, that's gamma. Okay, any question about this? The whole idea of dynamic programming is to come up with an optimal policy, not optimal action, okay? An optimal policy gives you the way you should behave over the entire course of the decision process, but the optimal set of actions would essentially tell you what action you need to take, and if things move around, if things shift, if there is a noise in the system, you are kind of screwed, okay? So your total cost will be quite suboptimal, and that's not good. So, so you always want to use dynamic programming. But what's the problem with dynamic programming? Can someone tell me what the problem with dynamic programming is? Yes. Computationally expensive, right? So at every point of time, for every possible state, you need to store the value function, and you need to store the optimal policy, okay? And you have to solve this minimization problem for every possible x, okay? So that's a big, big problem uh, in the theory of dynamic programming. So I just taught in 5551 uh, the linear quadratic Gaussian problem, uh, linear quadratic regulator problem, so that's a specific setting where if you're, if your cost is quadratic and your state space, your state transition equation is linear, you always have a quadratic value function and a linear optimal policy. So storing gamma one star is equivalent to storing a matrix in your computer, okay? Uh, but that's not, uh, but, but I'm not going to do the LQR problem here in this class because it's supposed to be covered in 5551 that many of you probably have already taken or would be taking in the future. But that's part of your assignments though, to solve the LQR problem. Uh, that'll be your assignment six. So why do we see a situation of this type? Why do we have to solve the second stage problem first and then come to the first stage problem? Why, why, why should we do that? So let's try to look at the cost function closely, okay? What do I have? What do I have in the cost function? So your total cost is actually a G1 of U1 plus G1 tilde of U1 plus G2 U0 plus G2 tilde of U0 comma U1 G0 G1. Okay, let's say you had two stage cost of this type. So this is what your cost is going to look like. And let's say you want to minimize with respect to U0 and U1. It's the sum of two cost functions in which one, one function depends only on u naught and the other function depends both on u naught and u1. How would you try to solve it? Well, you will realize that you can write this minimization problem as minimum over u naught, minimum over u1 
of g naught tilde u naught plus g1 tilde u naught u1. Okay, so I am breaking up this joint minimization as minimization with respect to one variable and then minimization with respect to the other variable. Now what do I notice if I stare at this equation for long enough time? What's evitable in this, in this uh, equation? What we see, what we observe by staring at this equation for long enough time is that this function actually doesn't depend on u1. Okay, so I can write it as minimum of u0 g0 tilde u0 plus minimum with respect to u1 g1 tilde of g u0 u1. Okay. Any questions so far? No? Makes perfect sense. And this naturally gives you the idea of dynamic programming. Solve the optimization problem for the second stage, then come back, add up this, this, this would be your value function, v1. Okay, and typically you write it as a function of state x1, but x1 contains u0, right? So x1 contains u0 in, because what is x1? x1 is f of x0 comma u0. So this contains u0 term here and this is this minimization is the value function at time 1 you add it up to the running cost at time 0 and then you solve the next minimization problem and this idea if you expand it for the end state setting you actually get the idea of dynamic programming right from the sequence of i mean just by using induction So that's the mathematical justification for using dynamic programming, okay? This is how Bellman thought about how to solve. So when Bellman was thinking about this problem, this is exactly how he decomposed this problem. Now remember, how did Pontryagin approach this problem? Pontryagin said, well, what am I going to do? So what I'm going to do is consider this as an unconstrained problem over the entire set of time step. I don't care what the state, intermediate states are. I'll write everything in terms of u0, u1, u2, all the way up to un or ut. And then he solved the entire problem at once. Okay, he solved, saw this as a huge optimization problem and solved it at once and got the optimal action, not optimal policy. What Bellman said, that you know what, I can, instead of trying to think of it as a giant optimization problem, I can break it up into stages, okay, and I can solve the last stage problem, then second last stage problem, then third last stage problem, all the way up to stage one problem. So Bellman thought, let's break down the problem. Don't look at it, the problem, as a, as a huge static optimization problem. Let's look at it by breaking up the problem into smaller problems and then look at smaller problems. Now, that has an obvious side effect that if you break up this big problem into smaller problems, you need to store the results of the smaller problems, okay? And that leads to what is known as the curse of dimensionality, which means you need a lot of space and computational power to store and process the value functions and to store and process gamma one star at every point of time. And people are still trying to deal with this curse of dimensionality. Okay, and this problem exacerbates when you talk about problems like autonomous driving and self-driving cars and, I don't know, autonomous rockets that goes to Mars and so on, because it's just too difficult to keep track of all the variables and the value functions dependent on those variables and so on. Okay, so typically what you would normally do if you were thinking about it from the machine learning perspective, you would come up with a basis function to store gamma one star, and you would come up with a basis function to store v1 at every point of time, okay? And that leads to what is known as approximate dynamic programming, because you don't do the exact dynamic programming, you do it approximately with some uh, uncertainty margin. Okay, any questions so far? Yes. Sure. 
chunks. Uh, if there, suppose there is no noise, yes. will this final solution be the no. same? It, yes, so the final solution will be the same. They won't be different. We, won't, we will reach the same optimal. Yes, okay. yes. So the solution that you would get by doing dynamic programming is exactly the same as the solution you would get from maximum principle, at least U1 star. Okay, the upshot of using dynamic programming is you get a policy instead of a specific action. Okay. Any other question? Okay. Okay, so now uh, what I want to do is uh, talk about neural networks because that's an application of, I mean, you can think of neural network as a dynamic optimization problem, okay? So I want to put forth that viewpoint uh, that you seldom actually see in the literature, but you can actually think of it as a dynamic optimization problem, so that's what I want to cover next. Okay, and the idea of neural network is I want to compose functions of one variable. Okay, so the idea compose functions of single variable. Why is that important, okay? So there is this uh, result in mathematics. It says that any continuous function from any finite space to any finite space can be written as composition of functions of single variable, okay? So the the uh, motivation, so there are two motivation, okay? The first one, which is the original motivation, is the biological motivation that all our neurons are essentially taking in multiple inputs, converting it into a scalar quantity, and then sending out that information to the next neuron in the line, okay? So that was the early motivation. The mathematical motivation is any continuous function f from rm to rn or rn to rm can be written as composition of scalar functions. Okay, so scalar functions are functions of a single variable. So the idea in neural network is to create a network with identical functions, okay? So this is a network of identical functions. So you create a graphical structure okay and So this is your input vector. So let's say x is in R n. This is your output vector. Let me put another output. So this is your y in R m. Yeah. And these are all single function, sigma, sigma, sigma. Okay. 
okay and each of these edges carry some weights w11 w12 and so on so what does this perceptron so this unit is known as perceptron so what does it do well it collects the output of the neurons in the or perceptrons in the previous layer adds it up according to the weight okay so it's a weighted sum and then you apply the function and then it outputs the uh, and then it gives you gives an output which goes to the goes as input to the neurons in the next layer so how do i write the state equation and the objective function here So the state equation is x t plus one equals to f of t x t w t, and the objective function is on the final x capital T plus one. So it's a terminal cost. So g t plus one x t plus one is given as norm of x t plus one minus some vector d square, and let me multiply it by half. And what is my f t? Well, f t of x t comma w t is actually given by sigma w t one x. Sigma W T M X, okay, where W T is a matrix okay, so this is the first row of W T, second row, third row, all the way up to M rows. And sigma is some differentiable function. Sigma from R to R. So what I'm doing is multiple. Oh, this one is x t. So what am I doing? I have this uh, matrix W. I take the first row of the matrix W, multiply it to x t. I get a scalar, and I compose it with sigma. So I get sigma of that that uh, scalar value, and that is the first first uh, element of this vector f t of x t comma w to t so this is my x t plus 1 okay is the structure clear for the problem so this is my terminal cost there is no running cost okay so no running cost So question so far. Yes. So W is a matrix, and sigma is some nonlinear function r from r to r. Okay. So typically, sigma of uh, z can be taken as one over one plus e raised to minus z. Or sigma of z could be max of zero comma z, and so on. Yes, w is the weight. Okay, so this is the weight of this link is w one one, w one two, w one three, w two one, w two two, w two three, and so on. Okay, yeah. Yes. So this will be a. This will be my x naught. Okay, this will be my x1. The output here will be my x2. The output here will be my x3. This will be my xt plus one. Okay, you might even have the first. I think usually the first thing is identity, so you don't actually change it. 
and that will be your x naught itself. Okay, so it will look something like this. Any other question? Okay, so what's the idea? You take a weighted sum of xt, apply a nonlinear function, you store it as the next state. Okay, same thing uh, with the second. So there will be a sigma wt2 multiplied by xt, and that gets stored as the second element of xt plus one. So remember that, so this is the state equation, this is the terminal cost, we want to minimize the cost subject to this state equation. So what should we do? Apply the maximum principle, right? So what does maximum principle say? Well, construct the Hamiltonian HT of XT, WT, and PT plus one, that's PT plus one, F transpose PT plus one, okay? Uh, let me write it completely. That's f of xt wt transpose pt plus 1. That's my Hamiltonian. And what do I know? Well, I know that gradient of wt of j is the same as gradient of wt of ht. I know this. What else do we know? We know that PT is actually gradient of XT of HT. So those are the things that we we know from our uh, from our uh, from the maximum principle, something that we have just studied in this class. So I start with some x naught, okay, and I want to come up with the weights, w's, in such a manner that my xt plus 1 becomes equal to d, okay? So that's my goal. I start with some x0, let's say x0 equals to c, and I want the output of this network to be equal to d, okay? That's why I have this sort of cost function. So what do I do? Well, what I have to do, I know that wt is my control variable here, okay? So at every point of time, I have to find the optimal control action at time zero, time one, time two, uh, so that the overall cost is minimized. So I have to run the back propagation algorithm. So let's see what that, what it means to run the back propagation algorithm. So all I need to find is gradient of wt of ht and I also need to find pt starting from p capital T plus 1. So let's do that. So anyone remembers what is P capital T plus 1? It was gradient of X T plus 1, G T plus 1, right? And that's equal to X T plus 1 minus T. Okay. Now in order to compute, P of T, 
and gradient of w of t of h of t, I need to I need to do some matrix manipulation. So let me just write that as a lemma, some of which you have already done as part of your assignment five. So assignment five question was, one was trying to solve this problem. Okay, so first part, if you look at, okay, so what is the setting? Well, W is a matrix in M cross N. X is a vector in R n. Y equals to W X is a vector in R n. And P is a vector in R m. Okay, so P and Y have the same dimension. Anyone remembers why P and Y have the same dimension? No? Well, it's because P would be the Lagrange multiplier corresponding to Y minus F of X T comma f of, well, let me introduce what f of y is, sigma y1, sigma ym, and you have this constraint f of wx, y minus f of wx equal to 0. And P would be the Lagrange multiplier corresponding to this equality constraint. Uh, so that's what I was that, that that's what I was referring to. That's why P will have the same dimension as the Y, which is the number of rows of the matrix W. Okay. Anyway, that's not the main thing here. So the first result is gradient of W I. So what is W i? I'm going to write W by stacking the row vectors together. So that's my W. Gradient of W i sigma W i x, that's going to be W i transpose sigma prime W i x. Okay. The second result is gradient of W of sigma. W i x will be zero 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 zero. Okay, so you have you have a non zero uh, row at the ith position. And rest of the terms are equal to zero. Okay, so that will be the derivative of sigma with respect to W. Remember, sigma is a scalar function, so a derivative with respect to W would yield a matrix which is of the same size as W. Okay, so just like you, you have a function from R n to R, you take the derivative, you get a vector in R n. If you take the derivative with respect to a matrix, you get a matrix in R m cross n. In the first one, you take the Oh, that's the right. That's the correct point. X transpose. So actually, it's just going to be X. The third thing is gradient of x of f w x that's going to be equal to w transpose gradient of y 
of W x. Okay, so remember W x is equal to y. Okay, so y is equal to W x. So you are taking the derivative of f with respect to y, which yields a diagonal matrix evaluated at W x. Okay, so these are the expressions that you will get for this particular lemma. Uh, I mean, if you do these derivatives, you get these expressions. So I've computed my PT plus one. Okay, that part is done. Now I need to use this lemma to compute my PTs and the gradient of the Hamiltonians. So let's uh, let's do that. I notice that my gradient of uh, so P T is going to be gradient with respect to X T of F T transpose P T plus one. And that is gradient, so that is equal to this. So what I get is WT transpose gradient Y of FT WT XT multiplied by PT plus 1. So that gives me the expression for PT. And then I have the other expression, which is gradient with respect to wt of ft transpose pt plus 1. This is the gradient of the Hamiltonian with respect to the action, which in this case is a matrix. What is that equal to? That comes from this expression, okay? So that's gradient with respect to y. Well, let me write it as yt of ft wt xt pt plus 1 xt transpose okay so that gives me So that gives me the co-state vectors <coughs> at every point of time, okay? So I have found what my PT, so I started with my X naught, so the algorithm is start with some random Lee generated W1 WT, okay? Well, K equals zero. And so W1 at K, WT at K. So I initialize with some random control action, just like we did in the maximum principal part. And then do the forward propagation. So, at, so the next step is forward propagation gives x1 all the way to x t plus 1. Right? And this is at time k. 
at sorry at step k of the iteration and then what do we have to do we do we have to do the backward propagation now okay so we do the forward propagation and then we do the backward propagation and i get pt plus 1 which is given here p 0 at k rather p 1 of k p 1 there is no p 0 here okay and then we com compute we update wt at k plus 1 equals wt at k minus some learning rate alpha k gradient of wk of f no wt ft transpose pt plus 1 evaluated at step k and go back Okay, so this is the uh, basic idea of neural network. You can actually view it as a optimal control problem, and in fact, you can also compute optimal policy. Now that it's a dynamic optimization problem, you can run dynamic programming and compute the optimal policy, except that it's not very useful. They are training W. So alpha k throughout this course. we have we have referred to alpha k as you know some parameter that you can pick armio rule or do whatever you know some fixed value or okay. use various uh, ways to come ways to come up with alpha k but that's not the part of well that's useful for back propagation but that's not the whole thing okay so it's not training alpha k alpha k is just 1 over k or something you know you can pick whatever you want it's really the training of wt which is known as back propagation algorithm so this this step is known as back propagation so you do a forward propagation you do a backward propagation and you update the weights and go back and do forward propagation backward propagation update the weight okay so the recent uh, uh some of the recent things that has happened in this field has been uh so there were there were several ideas that were thrown around post 2000 due to which uh, the theory of neural network received a lot of attention in the past 20 or so years and the ideas were how do you actually generate w1 to wt at the initial time step so as to make sure that you learn the best possible weight okay and the idea was to use auto encoders or restricted boltzmann machine and so on um that was back in 2006 and then recently there is a new idea which says uh you have to do something called batch normalization i don't quite understand what that is but i will hopefully in a few weeks um and and that has really transformed the way people trained neural network and that's the reason why so many people uh you know they were not working in neural networks but then they came back and started working in neural networks okay this was a hot topic in 1970s and then it became a hot topic now and in between was somewhat like dead years nobody worked on neural network whatsoever well no i shouldn't say nobody some people did work and they are the leaders in the field right now okay <laughs> so for 10 years nobody knew them and then suddenly after 10 years they came up with these breakthroughs and now everyone knows them okay so really research takes that longer time okay so it's not like in 2 years you will be able to do something great it does take uh, 10 15 years to do something Uh, really useful but this idea has been around since 1970s okay so this is not a new algorithm it's it's been around for a very long time uh, but yeah due to some recent progress it has yielded very good results in uh, recognition problems is it about like isn't it doing the entire 
Yes. Yes. So since we are using Hamilton, so this is a dynamic control problem where you are controlling the weights of the matrices. Uh, but back propagation actually suppresses the dynamic nature of the problem and actually solves the static problem. It's, it's solving the static yes. Problem. Yes. Uh, now, like, if we have a lot of data, we have right. Scenario, right. We cannot uh, calculate the entire. Correct. Uh, Correct. Stochastic gradient method, which is something that we haven't taught in the class so far. Will we be doing that? Well, it's actually not very easy, but not, well, not really. We won't be doing that stochastic gradient descent. Okay. Okay, but, the, but the idea is not very difficult to understand. Once you understand gradient method, then stochastic gradient is the natural next step to take. So until what time am I supposed to teach? Oh, I have five more minutes. Wow. Okay, so I'll go over stochastic gradient descent. What exactly is stochastic gradient descent? Now that you brought up that point. Okay. SGD. Stochastic gradient descent. So your function f of x is written as 1 over capital N summation i equals 1 to n fi of x. And you want to minimize this function min over x in Rn. And when I write n, I mean n is, ra n is of the order of 10 raised to 6. Okay. So let's say you are at step k. And you want to run the gradient method. So you have xk plus 1 equals xk minus alpha k gradient of f at xk. Okay, this is the usual gradient descent. So what is my gradient of f at xk? That's 1 over n summation i equals 1 to n gradient of f i x k. What is the problem with this? Remember that n is of the order of 10 raised to 6. Okay. So you have to compute the gradient of the function. So you have to compute the gradient of 10 raised to 6. So that's 1 million functions. Evaluated at xk. So that's 1 million evaluations. And sum it all up and take the average. Okay, So that's a lot of computation. So how do you simplify it? Okay, How do you simplify it? How do you, uh, how do you get to the minimum? or a local minimum without actually doing this sort of crazy computation. So the stochastic gradient descent says, you know what, I am going to pick ik randomly. So ik is uniform 1 all the way up to n. Okay, so you pick one index uniformly from one between 1 to capital N. So pick one of the functions out of 1 million function. And then you update xk plus 1 as xk minus alpha k gradient fik xk. OK. And you want your alpha k to go to 0 and summation of alpha k should be equal to infinity. Okay, you can pick alpha k any way you want, as long as you satisfy this, uh, this constraint. And in, in reality, this algorithm turns out to work very well, especially when you have 10 raised to 6 functions. Or rather, your, your objective function is composed of 10 raised to 6 objective functions clubbed together. 
uh, in the context of neural network in the context of neural network uh, stochastic gradient descent does a very good job okay very very good job and nobody understands why okay <laughs> so we had a talk in the ec department last week on thursday where uh, professor mattes telgaski from uiuc gave a seminar about why neural networks are able to perform so well in practice what's the reason and in our private conversation he mentioned that it has something to do with stochastic optimization but nobody understands why stochastic optimization well not stochastic optimization but stochastic gradient descent why does it work so well That's right. That's right. Exactly. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> uh, now, uh, I have to be careful here. So, if your function, if each of these FIs were convex and so, sorry, strictly convex and it satisfied some properties, then you can use what is known as martingales the theory of martingales that's a probability theory topic you can use that theory to actually prove convergence of xk to x star okay but that takes a lot of effort it's not that simple uh, but otherwise if you if you didn't put any structure on this problem no convexity no such assumption and all you were interested in computing a local minimum uh, all you get is a probabilistic guarantee which means that you will be close to the local minimum with very high probability but not with probability 1 okay so what i'm saying is probability of x infinity minus x star greater than epsilon is less than equal to 1 greater than epsilon is less than equal to delta okay so this is what i mean so x infinity will be close to x star with probability 1 minus delta okay that's what i mean so that kind of guarantee you can sort of kind of give in some situations any other question no okay i'll let you guys sleep at home uh, we'll meet each other next wednesday and the homework and the project is due next Wednesday in class.